This is a revision video on photosynthesis. There are six revision questions, so attempt to answer those questions, and then the remainder of the video will go through answers. Okay, so let's go through answers. So question one. So the diagram below shows a chloroplast. And so for the light dependent reaction, you should have said that it occurs in the thylakoids. Stacks of these thylakoids are called granum, singular, plural grana. And it's important to recognize that these provide a large surface area for photosystems to be embedded in the membrane, for ATP synthase to be embedded there, and for the electron transport chain. And the light independent reaction occurs in the stroma. Remember that that contains the enzymes for the Calvin cycle, but it also contains DNA and ribosomes, so the chloroplast can manufacture quickly enzymes are required for these reactions when it needs them. And you also see some black structures uh, in the bottom corner there. They represent starch granules, so the chloroplast can also store glucose in the form of starch granules. So question two, what are the photosystems? Here is a written answer. And so just to review, I'm showing you an image of chlorophyll Where are the photosystems found and where is chlorophyll found within those photosystems? Well, if we focus in on the thylakoid membrane, blue here is a membrane protein, and then within that membrane protein, the chlorophyll is embedded. And so that complex of a membrane protein and chlorophyll is what makes a photosystem. So question three, I wanted you to draw and annotate a diagram of non-cyclic photophosphorylation first. So what I'll do is I'll take you through the animation and within the animation there will be uh, descriptions of each process. So let's go through that.
Okay, so that summarises all the steps you should have uh, written down for non-cyclic photophosphorylation. And make sure to be very specific about the words you use in the description that you provide for that. So let's move on to cyclic photophosphorylation next. So this stage really focuses on photosystem one. So what we'll do is we'll go through those uh, steps that we talked about in non-cyclic photophosphorylation first to get that electron to photosystem one so we can look at the steps for cyclic photophosphorylation. So now the electron is, or the electrons are at photosystem one. Uh, the key events now really follow. So obviously we've established that uh, proton gradient that can be used to form ATP in this instance. Um, and then the next stage is, and here's the key step here. So I'll provide the text for this. This is the really important uh, thing that drives cyclic photophosphorylation. So we'll now carry on with the steps of cyclic photophosphorylation. So the thing to recognize is that because there's no NADP to accept those electrons, they return to the start of the electron transport chain and are passed back through the electron transport chain. And so this drives the production of ATP. So ATP production can continue. And so if there is still no NADP available, then this process can cycle round again, hence why it's called cyclic photophosphorylation. And that results in the continued production of ATP. Okay, so let's move on to the light independent reaction. So light independent reaction, also known as the Calvin cycle, it was uh, solved or the process was uh, discovered by Melvin Calvin and his team. So this occurs in the stroma and we start with carbon dioxide. So the steps um, we will go through and then I'll provide the text that you should have written down along with your diagram. So really important this step that you notice that the ATP and the reduced NADP for this reaction is provided from the light dependent reaction. And again, more ATP from the light Dependent reaction is used here to produce ribulose bisphosphate from TP. And finally,
So that is the Calvin cycle. So let's look at how the Calvin cycle works and how many turns of the Calvin cycle are required to produce a single glucose molecule. So I'm providing the diagram of the Calvin cycle again. I've left out the carbons for ribulose bisphosphate. That will become clear in, the moment, in, a, in a moment. The really important thing to remember before doing anything else here is this. So one in every six triosphosphate molecule contributes to glucose. So let's go through that diagrammatically. And what we'll do is we'll create a ribulose bisphosphate bank. So we started with turn one. So we know one in every six goes to glucose. So in this first term, we've only got two molecules of triosphosphate. They both go to the ribulose bisphosphate bank. So we need to turn again. Cycle turns again, and we get two more triosphosphate molecules. That's four in total. So we've only made four so far. So they go to the ribulose bisphosphate bank. And we turn again. We get two more triosphosphate. Now we're up to six. So we've created six triosphosphate molecules in, in total. So now we're ready to send one to, to make glucose. So remember, one in every six goes to glucose. So we've created six TP molecules in total. Five have gone to the ribulose bisphosphate bank that will contribute to making ribulose bisphosphate. And one has gone to contribute to, to making glucose. So overall, we've gone through three turns and we've got half a glucose molecule. So if we want a, a complete glucose molecule, we're going to have to do the same again. So I think you can work it out, but let's just go through it. So we turn again, that's two to the ribulose bisphosphate bank. We turn again, that gives us four TP, that goes to the ribulose bisphosphate bank. And finally, we've got six. So we now send one to the ribulose bisphosphate bank and one to form glucose. And finally, we have enough carbon to form a glucose molecule. So, that's required six turns of the Calvin cycle to make a single glucose molecule. And so just to go back to the ribulose bisphosphate, you notice that now, if we just purely look at the carbons from the triosphosphate that's contributed to the ribulose bisphosphate bank, we have 30 carbons from those six turns of the Calvin cycle. We know ribulose bisphosphate is a five carbon. So if we've got 30 carbons, and we're making a five carbon molecule from those six turns, we can make six ribulose bisphosphate molecules. And as you know, most of the triosphosphate does go to make ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, so hopefully that helped you understand how many turns of the Calvin cycle are used to make a single glucose molecule. So let's move on to the final question. So these are your answers uh, for the four factors that determine the rate of photosynthesis. And remember, it's really important that you apply this knowledge to graphs and data regarding how these uh, factors can affect each other and how limiting factors work. So don't just revise these. Please go on to, to apply this knowledge to uh, data, which is, is com a common way to be given exam questions for this. So this has hopefully given you a strong foundation for understanding photosynthesis. Once you feel your knowledge is strong of this and you're getting it right, please move on to doing questions in the textbook and the revision guide. Also read the relevant pages in the revision guide and textbook. Those pages are provided below in the descriptions.